I'm so honored to be here tonight. And when Alex asked me if I would take one of the nights, I think one of my hardest um, challenges is there's so much I want to share. And I know I can't in this limited amount of time. And I've just tried to pray and let God lead me of what I really want to speak on tonight. And it may be different from what you expected. And because uh, I've been in this field for a long, long time, and I actually started out my career working in a psychiatric hospital for children. And I was, you know, working my way through college and staying on, and I learned a lot. But I started out working with kids, and since that time, of course, I've been in private practice for about 30 years. I'm getting old. <laughs> anyway, and there's so much that I feel deeply about that goes into who we become. But I had to just choose somewhere for tonight of, of some of the nuggets that I would like to bring up to you. And then I'm hoping as I talk, it incorporates some of what the questions are that Alex sent my way. Probably can't answer all of them, but I'm trying to incorporate it in, in this uh, time together tonight. You know, one of the first things I thought about in preparing for tonight was this statement. Children will bring your greatest joys in life and your greatest pain. And those of you who love your children know what I'm talking about. And that's because that's our heart. Do you know where the enemy can attack me more than anywhere? Things about my children. Why? Because I would rather me be hurt than them be hurt. I would rather me suffer injury than them suffer injury. I want them to be more successful than I am. And people who really love like that, their children, that's where you're vulnerable. So where the enemy can mess with me and I can slide into worry or whatever is about my kids and eventually be my grandkids, but they're still young. And I was um, thinking about that, about, you know, the title of this was about raising them. But you know what, guys? It never stops. You think, well, okay, you get them raised and that's it. It's not. Your role changes, but you will be one of the major influences on who your children become. That's a scary thought. It really is. So I really wanted to start out explaining that one of the best ways you can help your children is you be healthy. You be healthy. And that's a lot of what I want to talk about tonight. How do you be healthy? And I want to tell you why that's so important with your children. In fact, um, you know, my youngest daughter is also a therapist, and she works with children all the whole shebangle. And I don't work with little ones anymore, haven't for many years. But I remember telling her the best way to help those kids, help their parents. And I really believe that. And, um, you know, I, I read about a survey that was done years ago where they polled all these different countries around the world, and they were asking parents, what do you want most for your children as they grow up. And all these different countries had different things. Guess what America's was? The number one for America families, I want them to be happy. There's something wrong with that answer. Nothing wrong with us wanting them to be happy, but we, I want my children to be who God designed. He had a design in mind. When I used to work a lot with teens, I would tell them, God has a real design, a plan for you, but the enemy does too. And a lot of times we, we don't want, we just want the encouragement, and I want to give that, but I also want to give some of the warnings and the equipping. And I've been really, really blessed in my private practice because God sends me people that really are receptive, and they're not offended by when I tell them things that they need to work on. That it's like they want the info. So I'm hoping that you feel that way tonight. I know that I used to teach a marriage class years ago when we were at First Assembly, and they probably got tired of hearing me say this, but I would say over and over and over, the best way to help your marriage, bring in a healthy person. You're the only one you got power over. And so I would talk about that with them. In the meantime, I want to look at, if you're going to help them be who God designed them to be, let's look at who did God design you to be. We know that to be healthy, we're going to deal with our emotions well. We're going to deal with frustration well. We're going to know how to deal with hurt. We're going to know about our thought life. None of us are going to measure up. I've realized that. So I don't want to discourage you, but I do want you to realize a lot of things start in childhood. 
You wouldn't believe how many adults that I've worked with with anxiety and fear. That's one of the number one things that brings people to counseling. They may not always realize that. They think they're depressed or they think that addiction. But underneath a lot of it has been fear. And you know how many of them told me, start in childhood. Said, I've worried ever since I was a little kid. And so we've got to understand how to deal with that. What I'd like to start out is to talk to you about some of the major influences upon how we develop. I remember whenever I was working on my doctorate, I taught at a couple of universities to earn my keep and to help my resume. And one of the classes I taught over and over and over was developmental psychology. A lot of you probably have had it. And it looks at the stages of life. And in there, I thought I was just, like I said, doing it for the money and the experience. I think God knew he wanted me to get it over and over and over. We really do go through stages. And in saying that, you never stop being an impact on your children. And some of you that are grandparents here, we have a huge role. And I realize that we need to understand some about development so that we have reasonable expectations for where our children are. And do you know, how many of you know, the brain is not developed until about the mid-20s, right around 25. Do you know that some research shows that some functions are 30s? I would agree with that. And yet, you may not realize your job's not done. You're still influencing them. And I want to first talk about... um, Well, even before I get to that, I want to talk about this. When I used to teach theories of personality, and I'd look at all these theorists of what they think, I was really drawn to one that made a lot of sense. He said, we start in early childhood developing our beliefs about what's important to strive for. What's going to make me significant? And is it going to be the best athlete? Is it going to be the best looking girl? Is it going to be the most fashionable? We start that. Alfred Adler said early in life, they start picking that up. Who do you think they pick it up from? They watch us. What's important to us? What do we spend our time and our efforts? What do we talk about the most? Is it about how you did in the game? Is it how you did in cheer? What we talk about establishes what's important to us, and they adopt that. And research shows this. That's scary to me. But in the meantime, I want to tell you a little bit about, um, has anybody ever heard of epigenetics? Yeah. Anyway, I was fascinated when I heard about epigenetics. Let me tell you what this is. I'm not going to hopefully get into any big um, detailed info. But what they found with epigenetics, you're born with your DNA, but your genes are influenced by what you're exposed to. Some genes get turned on and come into to influence and some don't partly by what you're around and what you're exposed to and how you act that was exciting research they really believe that's the underpinnings for all kinds of of conditions in life is this epigenetics and I want to give you just to whet your appetite a little bit because somebody had written some questions about I've had all this background of addiction what's going to happen to my kid is it going to make them more vulnerable yes and no let me tell you what I mean Back several years ago, researchers were studying about rats and how when they have their offspring, what they do is they lick them. That's their nurturing. And when they lick these rats, in fact, I don't know if any of the slides are supposed to go up or not, but I had some slides with this. But with the rats, when the mothers lick them, it makes a chemical reaction take place in the brain. And this chemical reaction makes their brain start to develop normally. And, and it turns off some of these stress reactions. When they kept the rats and they didn't let them lick the, the offspring, that chemical reaction did not take place. Instead, a different process happened, and it made them have a different genetic process that actually made their brains develop abnormal responses to stress. Now think about that. It turned on some genes, it turned some off, and it influenced how the brain, the brain is an organ, it influenced how it responded. We know that, and here's where me and Bobby and my bunch were, you know what, because 
They also found if your ancestors drank a lot, it changed how your brain processed alcohol. Here's the kicker. It passes on down generations. When they did this with the rats and they found, this is crazy, it changed their genetics, guess what? It passed to the next generation that hadn't even been done this way. They had exaggerated reactions to stress in their brain. So we know what we do affects our brain. And I'm saying that whenever I was in graduate school, we didn't even have the means to study some of this that we know about the brain now. What's really encouraging about it is it backed up what we were already doing. We were already trying to teach people about their thought life. In fact, I can remember when I first started hearing Pastor Eddie many years ago at Trinity, and we started visiting over there. And he was doing all these preachings on the thought life. I mean, that's his specialty. And I remember sitting there thinking, he's teaching cognitive therapy. People don't realize it. That is one of the most prominent research therapy approaches in all of psych. Over and over, they'll say, do you use cognitive therapy? I've had people call me, do you use cognitive therapy? He was teaching it from a Christian perspective. What we didn't know is it was making changes in the brain. It backed up what psychologists and, and Christian counselors were doing. We just didn't know it was changing the brain functioning. What we know now is every thought you have, it fires out your neurons, and it makes pathways in your brain. And the more you think a certain way, I picture it, I try to think simple, <laughs> I picture it like you're making grooves in your brain, like a creek bed, where well, that water just naturally goes there then. And when you do that, it may affect your next generation. Now, I know we got to watch that. That's good or bad, good and bad. You have an ability to affect just not your brain, but your children's. And not how you think, but how you act. Well, whenever I was in grad school, that was before I ever had children when I first started getting real interested in some of the research on modeling. It scared me. And I remember coming home to my husband, and he thought, oh, you're overreacting. And I said, makes me scared. If we have children, we could really mess them up. And he says, oh, come on. And I'm like, you've not read the research I have. One of the major influences on children is watching their parents. It's called modeling. They adopt things from you. And I've been reading research about this, and it really concerned me because not only do they pick up from you, if you tell them one thing, and they would do research like this, the model would explain the rules and tell them one thing, but they would do something else. Guess which one they followed? What the model did, not what they said. They followed their behavior. That was scary to me. In the meantime, I want to talk to you a little bit about two of the major um, influences, processes, what develops us as people, according to researchers. Two environmental processes. I'm not talking about the Lord and what, the, what God does. But the two major processes that have been studied and found to be so influential, the, the consequences you experience for your, for your behavior Certain, um, when you act a certain way, whatever follows that behavior will either increase it or you will back off from that behavior. It's rewards and punishments, consequences. Well, where I first saw the, the power of that was when I worked in the psych hospital. Now, keep in mind, these were pretty messed up kids. To go into a psychiatric hospital, some of them for months and months and months, Pretty extreme, but it amazed me. They trained us so well in how to use consequences to influence their behavior and what they felt. And what they would do is when the kids would come in, they would notice what was the biggest problems with their behavior, and then they would choose the opposite of it. If that kid come in and they were constantly fighting, they would, their goal that would be written up, when we would have rewards for them, was when they were getting along. When they came in, if they were constantly cussing and fussing like that, they'd pick the opposite and they'd reward that. And they really drained in our, put in our head, reward the opposite so that you'll increase that behavior. Well, you know what? I saw it working. And it amazed me to see the children's behavior start to change over several weeks. But you know what? It was a very controlled environment. 
I sure didn't do as well at it at home. You know why? Because you're living life. You're running from school to work and getting supper and all this. There, I come in, I'm on the job. I'm constantly scanning how I'm influencing this kid. That was very different with my own. And so, but our, what we do and what we dole out as rewards and consequences really does affect their behavior. But what I also saw is that I found myself thinking, what about when they get out of here? You think they're going to go out and everybody's going to reward the right thing? and you know, They're going out in the real world, and that bothered me. I started thinking, what about their self-produced consequences? You know, we can have some consequences we produce. You know, you might tell me I'm awesome, and I might think, I feel a failure. You might tell me, well, man, you're not good at all. But God may tell me, you got it, girl. We produce some in our own head. And I thought about those little kids. I assumed that part of what we were doing with our consequences was influencing them. But I also knew we were sending some amount into some pretty rough homes. And our world right now, you may be rewarding good behavior, but you know what? They may go over to that middle school and the kid that's the bully that makes fun of kids gets the reward. That's the popular kid. In fact, it really, really grieves me, but I've seen, I've heard some talk about, it was kids from our church that was making fun of me. I'm going, and I know their parents wouldn't want them doing that, but kids injure each other. And so I realize sometimes there's a messed up reward system that the world does. What are we going to do with that? At least keep in mind, do what you can do. You're going to be their greatest model and your prayers. What's one of the most effective processes we have? Praying. And that really never stops. One of the things I wish I had done even more of is prayed out loud my prayers and let them hear me. Recently, my grandson had come to stay with us one weekend and me and him were up talking real late one night, and I was praying, and he listened to me, and I could tell he was like, the things I was praying for him, he heard what I thought was important, whether I prayed for wisdom, prayed for him to resist and how he treated people, praying for him to love God. He heard my heart as I prayed for him, and I, could, and I thought, I wish I'd prayed more. I'm telling you what. I'd put up any sermon to if you listen to my mother pray. I hear her pray, and I've heard her pray, and I've heard her and Mark pray every morning on the phone, and I'm like, oh, my. It teaches me. I learn listening to her pray. We're their model. We're showing them what's important. And one of the things I wished I'd done even more is put the word more and more in them. We would do things. Now, I had a son with ADHD, the, my daughters back there are saying, talk about the one that gave you the most trouble. <laughs> and I'm going, what if it's you? <laughs> but I did have a son with ADHD. Well, he still has ADHD. It was hard to even read a book because he's jumping and bouncing and you're going, stop, stop, stop. And he's picking on the girls. And if anybody has one with ADHD, me and Tina was talking about that. I think all the men in our family probably have it. But anyway, the point is, the point is, you think they're not hearing you. You think, he ain't getting any of this. He's just all over the place. But you know what? In fact, I got his permission because I thought, I don't want him to be mad at me. But um, I asked him if I could read something he wrote when he was 19. And I want to read it to you because this is my kid that I would have never thought. And sometimes you're thinking, they're not listening to me. He couldn't care less what I'm saying. And then I read something he wrote that... Really, I was like, he heard me. Listen to this. Words to live by. Live for today. Make choices and never look back. Time always has a limit. So take every heartbeat as if it were your last. Live to make a difference. It's not what you have, but what you give that defines you. Love is the greatest gift, so don't be afraid to give it. Always stay humble for pride is the demon that can destroy us all. Don't get caught up in your worldly possessions. They are all destroyable and can be gone in an instant. Don't give out your word if you can't stand by it. It's easily lost 
but hard to restore it. Be loyal to your family and good to your spouse. Be an inspiration to someone and an example to everyone else. Now many friends will come and go, so cherish the few who last forever. Stay true to your faith and what you believe. This life's but an eye blink to eternity. Remember these things as you live your life. Tomorrow's never promised. What if tonight was your last night? I about dropped my teeth when I read this. I was like, that's that boy that was constantly arguing with me? Constantly. And I never thought, he's not listening. And the phrase that I would use over and over is, this life is not an eye blink compared to eternity. I thought, he heard me? I mean, I want to encourage you with that. You are a powerful, powerful influence on your children. And the enemy didn't want you to know that. But you know what? The scary part is, that can be good or bad. I'm just being honest with you that I've not always been the best influence on how I've handled things. I'm sure you can look at your own life. I, I have told many people, one of the things that as we get older, hopefully we get wiser. And I look at things and I look back and I think, oh my goodness, by the time you feel like you've really got wisdom, they're already grown. And you think, oh, that's why I hope some of you that are grandparents share your wisdom with your adult children. A lot of times they don't want to hear it. They go, don't tell me, Mom, I know. But plug them in anyway. Every once in a while, find an opportunity to say, listen, while yours are little, make time. You know why? We are busy, busy, busy. I did it too. But we run from here to there. And it's good stuff. But we many times don't leave enough time to sit down and have those talks and sit down and read the word or, or get them to memorize a Bible verse together. They're willing to do that when they're little usually. Maybe hard, but we're running. By the time you have wisdom, how many of you felt like, wow, I've already done it though. I've already, I've already you know, it's never too late. You wouldn't believe how many adults that I've counseled that when that adult parent would come and make time and talk with them, they still, it made an impact. I have had a number of people tell me, my kids have a very different grandfather than I did father. They have a different grandmother than I did a mother. We were running and going here and there and screaming at them, get your stuff, get your book. In. And now they can, don't think it's over. Make the influence you can while, you know, even as an adult. And you know, something else that I wanted, I wanted to tell you about the consequences and so forth. And one of the things that really fascinates me about psychological research, you would not believe how many times it will uncover, and they think they're uncovering it, and it was right there in the Word. But it still tickles me to go, okay. They come up about cognitive therapy. It was right there, as a man thinketh, so is he. And it was right there about certain thoughts are going to fuel anxiety. And I think about modeling to consequences we just knew, we learned, but it's not so inconsistent with psychology. With that said, one of the things I really want to encourage you about with your children and your family is accepting them the way they are. And what I mean by that, not that we don't try to influence their behavior, but how many of you know we're not all wired the same? We're not wired the same. When Bobby talked about his mind and going, choo, 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 that's my sons. That's my sons. Do you know some of you, you may have children that are wired with ADHD or they're on the continuum. We're all on continuums. Do you know in psychology, the diagnostic manual, they're all on continuums and we're all on them. It's just a matter of when it gets to a certain point when they say, okay, when you got this many, you got a diagnosis. But we're all on them. We can be high up on that. You can have children that, are more introverted. I remember putting Jennifer, uh, Bobby's Jennifer, on to a book many years ago called The Introvert Advantage. And she said, that book has helped me so much. She's an introvert. Go figure, she married Bobby, okay? But she said, it helped me so much to be okay with who I am. It's okay the way I am. And so be the best version of you. My son's just all over the page. And I remember when he was looking at applying for this certain position, and I saw the look on his face. He said, I went and saw the cubicle, and just fear on his head like, I'll go crazy doing that. 
you know, my mind. I got to get up, move. And I thought, right, my daughters are different. Your kids are different wiring. And you may go, I don't want them to be so hyper or I don't want them to be so prone to anxiety. We know the brain. We didn't even just, we come in with different wiring in our brains. The, the emotional center called the amygdala, some people says very sensitive and reactive. And you can say, oh, why are they so anxious about that? Well, you don't have their amygdala. And so I want us to recognize, you know, we need to try to recognize it may not be our fault, but it is our problem. It's our responsibility. Work with what we have. Work with what we have. And so we ha can have different wiring. We can have, but what this whole stuff about epigenetics shows, it can be altered. We can do some things about it. That's biblical. Do you know what I thought was interesting? When I was reading some about the epigenetics, I was reading about it, just scientific stuff, and it got way over my head because it got into some deep physiology and biology, and I was like, I could hang with it to a certain extent. But over and over, I found one carrying it to the fourth generation, like this, and it influenced, and it went on down four. And I went, do you know what the Bible tells over and over? It talks about things getting passed down, good and bad. When I looked up, I had no clue there were so many in the Old Testament. A number of them talked about to the fourth generation. I was like, scientists are finding this. And I'm going, okay. But we can influence it. There is a... Um, uh, a psychiatrist, a Christian psychiatrist who does a lot of research and so forth at Duke University. He's got credentials about like that, and I'm not going to bother to tell you all of them, but he is really intrigued with this. He's looking at faith and how it affects our genetics and our makeup and so forth, and he's saying, you know what? Healthy faith, we can possibly change the way the genes react, not only in us, but pass it on down. He even referred to research with clinically depressed mothers, but if they had faith, took their kids to church, it seemed like it protected their children. They didn't have, it's like statistically less depression went on down. We can influence that. It's never too late. But I do encourage you, if you do have a child that has some wiring that you know brain might be involved, get help. Educate yourselves. Find out. Say, there's things that God gave people wisdom to help us understand, even if it's to know how to help that child. But you know what we do instead many times? We compare. We compare. And in fact, I'm going to be talking about something in a minute that is really going to be the, the crust of what I wanted to talk about. Um, but even before I do, I want you to realize what happens early in life, and we got to deal with the rest of our life, is our human tendency to compare ourselves with others. It's caused some of the most damage of all in humanity. And it starts early, and it creates a lot of problems because we compare with each other. And in the meantime, your children do that. I've had many adults come in that have some wounding from that. And it's one of the reasons why mom and I did our book together. She did the illustrations, and I did the writing about a little story because I'm trying to help children recognize not to get into that game. They will. I know they will. But anything that helps lessen it, you want to do because it does cause great harm. You want them to be who they're called to be, not who somebody else is. We have not only different, we have different gifting. And in fact, um, we've got them for sale out here in the foyer. I had no clue that it cost so much to publish little books with color. <laughs> you know, I've, I've published some books that were, you know, two, 300 pages, but these little kids' books, because of the illustrations, but you'd want them for that, for mom, because <laughs> she illustrated them, and that makes it very special to me. But it was about trying to get kids to resist the comparing. But in the meantime, what I wanted to, to, to share with you, one of the greatest ways to help your children be protected from the enemy and to develop in who God designed them to be is teach them how to deal with hurt. Teach it. Let that be a very strong priority in your life. I want to teach my children how to deal with hurt. You know why? Because they're going to get it. Sometimes I'll watch my grandkids and I'll see them out there doing their tumbling and running through the sprinkler, and I think they're just happy and doing life. 
And my heart will feel a wave because I know they're going to be heartbroken someday. Somebody's going to break their heart. There's going to be injuries that come their way. We won't be able to stop it all. As soon as we have them, we're all wanting to protect our children. But guys, do what we can, but we're not going to be able to protect them from all the hurt. But we need to teach them how to deal with it in a healthy way. Because we can respond in ways that cause more damage than the original hurt. I see it all the time in my office. But who teaches us that? Typically, we just fall into patterns, all of us. So for you to show them, you got to learn yourself. How do you deal with hurt? How do you? Not only are they watching, how do you speak to each other? How do you talk to your husband? How does your husband talk to you? They're watching all that. They're watching. But how do you deal with your hurt? How do you deal with it? That's what I want to spend most of the rest of the night talking about, how to deal with hurt. Okay? And you may go, what's that to do with parenting? Everything. You deal with it well, and you'll be automatically able to tell it. Only teach them. Sometimes you can tell, but they'll watch you. Kids pick up more than you think. They know when you're hurt. They know, they, they pick up more than what you realize. But in the meantime, you still need to do it even with your adults. You may have a child that's going through a, a horrible divorce, and you're trying to help be there for them. You may, whatever. But anyway, in thinking about how to deal with hurt, I'd been doing this a long time, and I started noticing over the decades what are the common ways, the most common ways that we respond to hurt in an unhealthy way? What are the most common ones? And I thought, I'm sure Bobby and Pastor Eddie and other pastors, they use acronyms and little slogans. I use like, why? Because we forget. And I think if we don't remember to use it, what, what good is it? We have to be able to remember because the big key is monitor. How am I handling it? What am I doing? So I came up with an acronym for the ones that I felt like are the most common. I did have some slides, but I don't know what happened to them, that tells you the acronyms, but I guess you'll just have to... Are they? Good. There we go. These are the common ways that we deal with hurt. And, you know, the first one, I think we all do this some. I will catch myself and I think, oh, I'm doing the D one. I'm doing the D one. Because I think I'm letting that define me. When we've been hurt, it might be at work, it might be a spouse, it might be whatever, we're apt to let it define ourselves or God falsely. And we go, man, I just don't do anything right. My husband left me because I'm just not that interesting. Or I, I'm just da da da. They didn't pick me because of this, or they did that. And we falsely believe something that's not true. Either that God don't really see me that way. I'm not that important. Some way we do that. The other one, A, we accuse. We can be hurt and we accuse somebody else of something. Now, I want to talk about that one a little bit. I see a lot of that in marriages. I think we all do it some. And we don't many times realize we're doing it. That I'm hurt, but then next thing you know, I'm accusing you about something because I'm hurt, okay? And we do that. One of the things I wanted to share with you that I feel so strongly about, and that is this. If you don't deal with your wounds, they will affect your children. Your wounds will affect your marriage. Your wounds will open doors to the enemy to really mess with you. And you know one of the ways he does that? He distorts your perception of reality. The example I've used before, let's say I grew up being made fun of. The other day I ran into somebody and memories came back when I was a little girl. And she was a little girl that was horribly made fun of. And I remember it. I never participated. Mama would have probably beat the people that was making fun of her, but I just didn't do it. But I remember how she was made fun of. Now imagine if you're made fun of and you come in and I go, I can tell she's looking, she's looking me a dirty look. She don't like me. She don't like what I'm saying. And she's like, what? Well, I'm not doing anything. But that's what I see. That's what I see. Because I'm seeing it through my wounds. I'm seeing it through my wounds. Let's say I had a dad that, wasn't emotionally available. And I've married somebody that's kind of quiet. Jennifer's dad was a very quiet man. 
And if I say, well, I'm not important to him. I'm not, instead of, that's just who he is. But my wounds, I think he's not, I'm not important to him. Our wounds affect our sight. I tell my couples all the time if I'm working, I say, listen, your perception is your reality. That doesn't mean it's accurate. And you need to be willing to see. If I can see that one's more wounded, I recognize they probably have more distortions than the other one. You know, we, we got to realize all of us can get distorted because our background affects what we perceive. But we can perceive things through our insecurities, through our wounding, and it hurts our relationship. And if that's one of the reasons why I say, if you want to be protected in the spiritual war, deal with your wounds. Go after some healing there. It helps to talk to someone, to find out that many times it's based on falsehoods. It's a whole nother ball game about how to heal, but at least know that they're there. M, we medicate. People automatically think of drugs and alcohol. Yeah, that medicates, but we do other things. We sleep, we fuss, we overeat, we can get into pornography. I remember a, a one person, a lot of the pornography was fueled by anxiety. I just distract over there. We do a lot of things to medicate our pain sometimes. The G stands for unhealthy guilt. I've got some pros of that in my family <laughs> that feel guilty for everything. <laughs> and, but we can be hurt and somehow we feel bad, like we've done something. And I heard, um, anybody ever listen to Dr. Robert Jeffries? He's awesome, if you ever listen to him. But he was saying that the other day in one of his sermons, he said, there's no such thing as false guilt. It's misplaced guilt. Either way, we can be hurt and then end up having this misplaced guilt. All of these that are the unhealthy ones create problems. A lot of times worse than the original hurt. The E, we entertain fear. We entertain it. I've been hurt, so now I'm afraid. I, I, I start getting afraid. A lot of times hurt fuels fear. These are some of the common ways that we respond to hurt. We go on down. I start thinking, well, how can we be intentional? We're going to get hurt. Our children are going to be hurt. How are you going to recognize if they're doing one of these? Somebody had written in a question and was talking about when my child gets disciplined, they get so upset, and then they start saying, you know, like, I'm stupid, and I'm bad, and da-da-da. What do you do? Now, keep in mind, you got to first figure out what's the motive, and sometimes you don't know. But sometimes, I know when I used to do parent training, um, I used to use this system many years ago, and it had a little chart, and it was so cool. It said, when a kid's acting out, first kind of decipher what's probably behind it. Is it they're wanting attention? Is it that kid's being manipulative because they want you not to discipline them? I'm so stupid. No, you're not. You know, are you feeding into something you don't need to feed into? Or is it... You need to go back and address that if they really feel that way. But in the meantime, as you're dealing with your own children's hurt, the, we can be intentional. Merciful is the acronym I used for some healthy ways to handle hurt. The first one, ministering to others and let others minister to you. I know I, uh, I went and just vented and vented some things that I was hurt about and struggling with to Pastor Eddie do you know everything he told me, deep down in my spirit, a lot of it he just listened and I just vomited because everybody vomits to me, so. <laughs> and I want him to, but I just let it out. But you know what? It helped me start to heal. Why that is? The Bible says, confess your faults to one another. I think that means hurts too. And pray for one another that you may be healed. When you let yourself talk to somebody else, but the other part about this is ministering to others. When I say, you know what, this is, in fact, I talked to somebody just today and I said, wow, this is going to be an area. One of the things that's going to help you heal when you start ministering to other women because of what you just dealt with. It's going to help you heal. When you start, because you know what, if somebody gets up here and they've never had an issue with their kid or they don't seem like it and everything seems, and you go, they're going to minister to me. But if they say, let me tell you, mine was doing this and I felt like this, and you go, what? When you start ministering and using your hurt to help somebody else, it will help you heal. I promise you. 
but we've got to not let our pride get in the way. I can still remember. Do you know when my, when my son wrote that? What I read to you? It was when me and his dad was separated. It was a bad scene, and it was a bad time in our life, and he wrote that. And I remember thinking, I work with all these couples. And I'd keep thinking, God, don't, don't send them here. What are they going to do if they find out what's going on with us? And do you know what? My office got flooded with couples. And I was like, oh. And the devil would say, don't meet with them. Who do you think you are? And I think I, God would many times say, don't you turn them away. The only way God got power over is you. You be real with them. So when I would tell them, I remember one time, this one, I was, felt this little urging Tell her about this. And I was like, not her. She knows me and my husband both for a long time. And God wouldn't let me stop. He said, you tell her. And when I did, she was like. It was at a time I had just got finished teaching the marriage class for three years. I'd come in and I'd see people from my class. And of course, he wasn't with me. And they'd be looking at me. And I was embarrassed. But you know what? I kept coming. I think, don't ask me where he's at. You know? My point is, we got to get over ourselves. If we will share with other people, open the floodgate in. Now, my husband and I have been married for 41 years, and God did a lot of good work, but we went through some stuff. When you minister to others and you don't let your pride get in the way, I didn't want to. I was like, God, I don't want to tell her. But I'm telling you, it will help you heal. It will. The E, encourage ourselves in the Lord. We could spend forever on this one. We could do a whole thing, and we don't have time. But you need to learn how to encourage yourself, and your kids will, will see you. Let me tell you why I say that, too. This is all about dealing with hurt. When my mom went through one of the most painful things in her life, getting close to being a year ago, a lot of you know my Aunt Gladys. She don't doubt where Gladys is at, but it's one of the hardest things she's ever dealt with. She'd tell you that. They were like this. You saw one, you saw the other one. They, they did life together, and she died in her sleep, went on to be with the Lord. It'll be September the 22nd. Yeah, 22nd. I've watched her. I go spend the night with Mom every Thursday night, but I've watched her. She's been open about her pain with me and how much she misses her. And she, I made her a little picture, and she'll talk to her, and, and we'll talk, and she misses her so badly. But I've also watched her encourage herself in the Lord and keep going to ministry, to jail ministry. She always had Gladys with her. Now she don't. She does the green. Now she don't. But she kept on. And that t showed me, you know, as my age, how am I going to deal with it when my loved ones pass? I watched my mom. And I saw she knows to encourage herself in the Lord. How does she do that? She knows the word. I'd put her up against any of the pastors here about knowing the word, including. <laughs> she can memorize. She could sit and talk the word like you wouldn't believe. She's memorized it. We need to t get that in our kids and in ourselves, so that I remember Pastor Eddie saying one time years ago, he said, if you'll put the word in you when you don't need it, the Holy Spirit will bring it out when you do. And mom can say, yes, but I know God said this. Yes, but I know God said that. Because she's hurting She's hurting. In the meantime, the next one, restorative grief. Not all grief is restorative. We can grieve the loss of a job, a betrayal, a divorce, a death. But you know what? It always, if it's going to be restorative, there has to be acceptance and hope. And if you don't include that, we can just stay in depression. Um, sometimes when we're hurt, we need to confront. Not every time, but sometimes we do. Sometimes a healthy reaction will be to confront. And I, to be quite honest, I think we need a lot of teaching about that. So I'm going to leave that to my little brother. But we do. I do think, I have thought for years, Christians need to be taught. Because we just go, turn the other cheek. There's times we need to be taught how to do that in a healthy way. It can be a godly thing to do if we do it in a healthy way. But confrontation, and this is a biggie, install boundaries. Sometimes we need to teach our children by ourselves when they need to install a boundary with maybe a relationship, something that's happened where they've been hurt, and they need to back off, 
They need some boundaries. And then, of course, forgiveness. When we've been hurt, you can almost guarantee it's always going to need to be some forgiveness. It may be, i got to forgive myself. I've already asked his forgiveness, but why did I do that? I was having somebody today, and we were agonizing about some things, and it was like she knew she had brought on a lot of it, okay? But, and she was hurt, but she knew I was her advocate to try to help her forgive herself and go on. And that leads into, well, we'll let me do this one first. Do you understand what you're feeling? And sometimes you got to let yourself feel it. There was, uh, for years, about 13 years, I had a physician's group, and it was a group where physicians came in once a week for a counseling group in recovery. And I remember um, there was one guy that came in. He's not alive anymore. But, and I remember when he called to get directions, I thought, I can't believe this guy's talking to me like this. He was mad about me not returning his call quick enough and that I didn't give good directions. And he was cussing me, and I was like, are you kidding me? I'm not going to put up with this. You're the one that's got to be here, you know, but something in here told me stop, and I just acted like I didn't notice it. He came into the group, and a few times when he talked, I'd never heard anybody in there cursing like this, but anyway, somewhere in the group one day, all of a sudden, he said, underneath all that anger, I'm always afraid, and I was like, and everybody in there was a man except me, and they all said, yeah, me too, and they were saying, what they were usually feeling was angry. But he was finally starting to realize in counseling, he was scared. And I thought, understand what the real feeling is and let yourself feel it. And it may be underneath there you're afraid or you're hurt. But anyway, so you've got to understand your feelings and feel them. Women a lot of times are giving more practice on that than men. But men are coming along. And I do want to share just a little side note there. I really want to put a plug in. For dads, you would not believe how many of the people I counsel would have so benefit if their dads would talk with them about deep stuff, emotions. And now maybe you guys do, but a lot of men don't. The women do. And they want their dad. They want their dad to talk to them like that, like, no, my dad doesn't do that. I had one recently, and he said, my mom will, but not my dad. Guys, don't miss that opportunity. Even if they're grown, go talk to them. The last one, L, love yourself when you're hurting like you would if it was your friend. The lady that was hurting with me so bad today, I said, now, love yourself. How would you do if this was me or your friend? You could see the look on her face. I said, love you through this hurt. You made some boo-boos, but love yourself. That's a healthy way to respond to your hurt, you know? Sometimes parenting, I look at this and I think it's one of our greatest assignments. And you may think, well, we just go become parents. Who trains us? Life was training you before you ever had them. That could be good or bad. I encourage you, retrain yourself if you need to. Some people didn't have a good model in their parent. They didn't. They may have loved them, but, and they had to relearn how to handle emotions and hurt and what's important. And I encourage you, do that not only for yourself, but for your children. Relearn this of how to do it. And in the meantime, of recognizing that if you ever feel, um, I've just blown it so much. And I think we've all felt like that sometimes. And if we said, you know, you're worried about your child or, you know, a lot of times I didn't worry so much when I were little. You know why? I had more control over them. I could do like Alex and Elizabeth said, and I could put them in time out. I made mine write sentences. My son would take three pencils and do them all at the same time. I didn't care. He thought he was getting one over on me, but it was, I needed to consecrate something. But I could do that, or I could send them to bed early. You can't do that when they're 35 or 40. But my point is, you're still an effect, and you're still yearning to have an influence on them. So sometimes it gets harder in a different way because you don't have that ability to do that when they're older. But I wanted to share with you that um, one of the examples about wiring, when I was working on this, I was in the den and my husband was in there and we had the television on. He said, listen to that. 
And it was Las Vegas had done this huge project where they were trying to make this real lush oasis in the desert. And there's no telling how much money they put into it. I don't know if you all saw this the other day. Massive amounts of money and effort. And it finally got such a drain. They chucked the whole thing, pulled it all up and said, let's plant what's, what's a natural for this environment. Duh. And they started putting plants that thrive in the desert. Your children, my son is wired very really different from my daughter. His gifting is different. And I look at that and I think, do you know where he's at right now? Take a wild guess. He's in Thailand, in some island out in the middle of the ocean somewhere, learning to be a master scuba diver. Now, <laughs> God help me. God help me. My oldest daughter thinks he's nuts. She thinks he's nuts. Now, don't get me wrong. He worked at the same company for 10 years. He did awesome. His sales, he was the top salesman in Nashville. He designed Peterbilt trucks. And he did awesome at it. And it worked with him because he could move around and do different things. But that economy went tank really bad. And we had some changes in some of the things that happened and some restrictions that got put down and it really impacted him. And he was looking for different things and I'm going, oh. And, buddy, I've done some praying. <laughs> in the meantime, I know it's a great honor and I wanted to close with because I know that everybody's got to get home and everything. And I wanted to close with a poem that my mother taught me when I was a little girl. She didn't know the name of it. She didn't even know who the author was. But as a little girl, somehow it resonated with me. I was one of those weird kids. My grandson's kind of like this. I was a deep thinker. Even as a little kid, I thought, wonder why we end up the way we do. Wonder about this. I wrote an essay in middle school about the recipe for a good life. What? What did I know? But I'm saying, I mean, nobody probably would have thought about this point. But when mom told it to me, I was like, oh, I want to memorize that. But I added to it. I added to it. So I want to read it to you. I gave it a title, The Great Potter. I took a piece of plastic clay and idly fashioned it one day. And as my fingers pressed it still, it moved and yielded to my will. I came again when days had passed. That bit of clay was hard at last. The form I gave it, it still bore, and I could change it nevermore. I took a piece of living clay and gently formed it day by day and molded with my power and art a young child's soft and yielding heart. I came again when years were gone. It was a man I looked upon. The early imprints he still bore, and I could change him nevermore. I added this, yet the potter made the clay so grand, it's only he with the powerful hand that can smooth the cracks and mend the holes and change hard places into pockets of gold. He gently bent and stroked the heart and shows that he knew just where to start. I watch with wonder as I exclaim, oh me, the resemblance is striking as Jesus I see. How could I have not known all along the potter's hand is where he belonged? God always had the plan in mind. My son would look like his when Jesus he'd find. No matter what mistakes we've made, no matter what, the, it's never too late. Bobby encourages me a lot of times about God's not done. We're his workmanship. Your children and your grandchildren, your adult children, he's God's workmanship. And I just want to encourage you with that, but also to motivate you. Think what you're doing. Get healthy. 